So welcome everybody. We can uh, start with our uh, conference of today. Okay, thank you, Philippe. Good afternoon, dear colleagues, dear students, dear guests, to uh, this uh, second uh, sino luxembourgish webinar on COVID-19 issues. Uh, please let me uh, say some words about why uh, Luxembourg University started uh, these kind of uh, broadcasts. Actually, um, our first idea was to uh, train uh, medical students for the so-called sanitary reserve corpus that was created uh, months ago by our Ministry of Health. Now, uh, fortunately, uh, we got the impression that this uh, first wave of the pandemics in the country of Luxembourg is under control, and uh, we considered that it would be um, appropriate to broaden the audience, not only to students, but also to doctors in our country, and uh, to offer them the opportunity to learn from others. And obviously, as China has a huge experience with an anteriority of uh, some four months to our country, the return of experience from our Chinese colleagues was considered essential. However, we have also to admit that the pandemics uh, with these wave of uh, acute infections is not the sole problem. Uh, there is a second uh, problem behind for our healthcare uh, systems. This is all other diseases uh, for which uh, treatment or care has been postponed so far that sooner or later will need access to healthcare. And then uh, the uh, next problem behind is that while con confinement strategies are so far the sole prophylaxis uh, that we can apply uh, is expected to carry disastrous consequences on econ economical uh, grounds worldwide. So uh, today we have chosen this uh, final problem as main topic and it is my great pleasure uh, to welcome uh, two uh, top specialists from China, uh, Professor Wang who is director of the Institute of World Economy at Fudan University and uh, Professor Ding, who is a director of the Center for European uh, Studies at uh, Fudan University uh, as well. And I'm happy to uh, welcome also uh, the leadership of both universities who kindly offered their patronage. And uh, so uh, I give it a personal honor uh, to name uh, Professor Stefan uh, Palage, who is uh, Rector of uh, Luxembourg University, and Professor Chen, who is Vice President of uh, Fudan uh, University. So maybe, um, Stefan, if you would like to say some words on behalf of the host. Thank you very much, uh, Gilbert. Uh, dear Professor Chen Chimin, Vice President of Fudan University, Dear colleagues from Luxembourg and China, dear guests, bonjour, ni hao, hello. As a rector of the University of Luxembourg, it is my privilege to welcome you to this webinar on the economics of COVID-19. We are experiencing the, one of the biggest crises since, uh, since World War II. For the very first time in my lifetime, at least, the world is united in the fight against COVID-19. Collaboration is absolutely essential to win this battle. Last week, a similar webinar was organized to open dialogue between medical doctors of Luxembourg and Wuhan. This exchange of experiences and research results is actually remarkable. Today, we do the same regarding the economic impact of the pandemic. I salute my dear friend Chen Temin of Fudan University, with whom the University of Luxembourg has built a very active, very dynamic Confucius Institute. In fact, Professor Chemin was supposed to be with us tomorrow for the Board of Trustees of the Institute. 
Of course, this was not possible. And we will, of course, have to revert to video conferencing. But I certainly hope, uh, I certainly look forward to the day we can shake hands again. Uh, this will be a very long uh, handshake, let me tell you. Thank you very much and have a great conference. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan. Uh, we hand now the microphone uh, to Professor Chen, please. Professor Chen, can you hear us? Yes, uh, Rector uh, Paraj and all the colleagues and students uh, from the Luxembourg side or Europe side. Uh, I'm very glad to be here in this meeting. Uh, as uh, Rector said, that I'm supposed to be in, in Luxembourg uh, uh, for our meeting of uh, the board meeting of the CI. Uh, but uh, this is uh, still a wonderful time in this difficult time uh, for us to meet and discuss serious issues. Uh, China certainly at this moment, we have uh, almost contained the virus. And according to our schedule, uh, next week, we will have the first batch of uh, students, mostly the graduate students, back to the campus. Uh, so we are still uh, gradually recovering and returning to the normalcy uh, in, in the universities. Uh, during this uh, outbreak, uh, you know, we are a comprehensive university. We have a very big uh, medical uh, college and also like uh, 17 affiliate hospitals. So we have sent almost 500 doctors and nurses to Wuhan um, to help the Wuhan to fight uh, the outbreak of the virus. Uh, also the two affiliate hospitals in Shanghai they are the two designated the hospitals in Shanghai to, to, to treat the, the infected patients uh, here. So the doctors and nurses have been doing a wonderful job. And a um, few days ago, uh, the doctors and researchers from the uh, Zhongshan Hospital, one of the most famous hospitals in China, uh, which is also affiliate hospital of Fidan, they just released uh, Zhongshan Hospital's uh, solution of treatment of these uh, infected patients. Uh, they have uh, now an English version, maybe about uh, 60 or uh, 50 pages long, how they treat uh, you know, the, uh, the patients. So since we have a lot of the professors and uh, uh, students from the medical school, so I, I, I think that I would try to uh, you know, uh, pass on this PDF to you uh, so maybe the students and professors could look at it and see how, you know, they come up with this a treatment solution uh, based on their, you know, massive treatment of the patients in Wuhan and also in, in Shanghai. So could be uh, helpful uh, for, for uh, our colleagues uh, in that, in, in the medical side. But I know that today we are more focused on the uh, economic side. And we already had the figures uh, of the, the season one. Mm -hmm. uh, the Chinese GDP is down by 6.8%. This is the first time for decades that we reduced uh, such a big uh, negative growth. Uh, but I think this is uh, extraordinary. Uh, but since many of the factories are back to work, so we hope uh, still uh, or economy in the year could still register a positive growth. Uh, maybe the World Bank predicted us is 1.2%. But next year, might, might be 9%. <laughs> so uh, that might, that could be a good news. Uh, but still, everybody is now in difficult uh, time. Uh, and I think this is a very important occasion uh, for the uh, professors uh, to discuss with you on how we can uh, you know, recover the economy and from this, um, yeah, uh, big uh, public health crisis. Uh, and I think we're, by working together that we would uh, get over it. So I'm very glad that we have uh, this uh, 
very deep uh, comprehensive relationship with um, the University of Luxembourg. And I think we are going to discuss about uh, setting up some research center on the financial law and in intellectual property things. Uh, I hope that our team will work together closely uh, in the coming weeks or months and, and come up with a solution. So I'm very looking forward to the, tonight's uh, workshop. Thank you very much for providing this opportunity. Thank you, Professor Chen, for these uh, nice words. And uh, above all, uh, thank to your institution for this uh, very prosperous and uh, perspectiveful uh, cooperation. Uh, so uh, I think time is ready now. Uh, the audience is uh, almost uh, complete. Uh, that we switch to uh, Professor Wang's uh, presentation on the economic consequences of the uh, uh, COVID infection uh, pandemics in China. Just so I can... try to the PPT. Yeah, we will get the presentation on the screen in a few seconds. So I think Professor Wang's uh, PPT is, uh, has some difficulties to upload. And community Whether whether on your side you have the. Uh, um, I mean, I can change, I can uh, uh, charge. Normally, it uh, should be this one. Yes. Is this one right? No, this is Professor Ding. Ah, okay. So which one you want? Professor One. Okay. One. Okay. You see, you need to upload it again. Okay. Okay, okay. let me see. I am thinking this one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, you want to do a screen sharing or you want to upload it? Because it's not working. Upload one is very. Yeah, uh, it takes time to upload, so we can switch to a uh, screen sharing eventually. Because, uh, yeah. Um... So this one we have to stop because it's. Oh, yeah, it's working. Mm -hmm. I, am, I am uploading the file. So mm. be patient, several seconds, it will come out. Okay, uh, I see. Uh, I see. Uh, yes, I'm I see. uploading the final version. It, okay, take, which... it will take one minute to be ready. Okay, uh, which one are you uploading? The... Uh, it's uh, Lux COVID Fudan Professor 1 version oh, okay, because... final. Oh, okay, uh, because there is another one which is called LuxCovid2, which is up also uploading, so I, I can delay it? Uh, yes. I, I, normally, I already... Yeah. So just wait for one minute, and it should be okay. Okay. So... Maybe you can explain how we will uh, do with the question afterwards. Uh, yes. So uh, please allow me to introduce our agenda today. So we will start with the presentation of Professor uh, Wang Guanghua. So he is the expert uh, from World Wide Side 
for the economy. Uh, and he will present us his uh, view on the impact of COVID-19 on the world economy and the strategy he, he wants to propose to us. And then after this presentation, his colleague, Professor Ding Chun, will present us a keynote on the Sino-European relation after this COVID-19. After these two presentations, we will have an uh, open discussion, round table discussion, which will be um, animated by two professors from University of Luxembourg and the West President of Fudan University, also with Professor Ding Chun. Yes, and at the end, we will inform our participants the next webinar and the practical information. So normally today's webinar will be one hour and a half. So please be patient and thank you again for your participation. And I would like to thank the audience 稍后有一个现场的讨论，大家可以在油管上面给我们发出提问。谢谢大家。Okay, so the presentation now, I think it's okay. Uh, Philip, can you see the presentation, the last one? Okay. Okay, so I will turn off my audio. Uh, Wang Jiao Shou, Professor Wang, it's uh, your presentation. I, I think it's ready for. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay, many thanks for the opportunity to uh, share the, some of my views uh, regarding the impact of uh, COVID 19. Uh, uh, many on the Chinese economy and, and, and also some of my uh, concerns. Uh, I, I have to uh, uh, really make it clear, this is uh, really my, my personal view. I, I haven't really talked uh, to anyone, certainly not uh, our uh, vice president. So, so it's, it's totally my, my own view. Some of my views uh, is possibly uh, debatable even within China, uh, but that's my personal assessment. Uh, so basically, I, I, I will do two things. Um, uh, first, I, I want to uh, just briefly discuss the, the, the growth scenario um, for China this year and also beyond this year, because this year is uh, obviously uh, very different you know, once in 50, 100 years, uh, but we've got to look in you know, the medium and long run. And I, I want to start with this, uh, uh, this table. This is the, the official uh, statistics on on the growth of quarter one of the Chinese economy, as uh, uh, Vice President Chen already mentioned, the the growth rate actually dropped to negative almost seven percent. Uh, that was uh, to some uh, that was actually uh, uh, better than they projected. Certainly, than, than my own guess, because the, when this uh, epidemic broke up in China in early February, my own assessment was going to be more severe, maybe eight, nine, even close to 10%. But uh, there are also, uh, obviously uh, economists in China and outside think, you know, they won't have even negative growth at all, might be, you know, small positive growth. So in the end, uh, this number only came up a few days ago, and, and I was happy to see it's only, you know, less than 7%. But I wanted to make two points. Uh, which some of you may or may not really know. One is the investment in quarter one dropped um, more than 16%. Uh, this is quite a big, and that's something I actually uh, base my future assessment on that. Now, there are also some discussions regarding this 16% drop. Uh, you know, there, there are certain um, arguments saying this, maybe the actual drop in growth uh, is more than 
6.8%, giving this huge drop in investment. The second point I want to make is that's something I've been very much concerned uh, for a long, long time, obviously at the beginning of epidemic and, and, and right now I'm most concerned are the migrant workers. As some of you may know, China has a huge, probably unprecedented um, in human history, this huge number of migrant workers, about 300 million, maybe 290, but close to 300. And they are in the lower end of the income ladder in China. It's a huge group. But if you look at number, there were 54 million not returned to the city of you know, where they, they, they were working last year, and certainly not returned to their work yet, although you know, a lot of them did come back. And they don't really have uh, the, the full support of the current you know, social welfare system. And that's something I think a lot of economists are very concerned. And also, unless they really come back, unless the employment uh, uh, can maintain at the same level as last year, or hopefully increase, but not decrease, or not decrease so much, then the Chinese economy will have some problems. So that's two uh, extra numbers I wanted to uh, share with you. Now, I need to pick it up. Okay, so uh, right now the, the, the economists in China, uh, many uh, are proposing about 3% of, of growth um, in 2020. And, and you may also know the People's Congress is now right now in session. And, and usually in the past, the government will set up a, a growth target. And uh, before this attempt, we were all thinking about 6% and so on. And uh, right now, uh, people uh, certainly are, are adjusting their expectations. And, and we're talking about um, 3%. So, so I did uh, two scenarios here. You can see case one is you know, the, the expansion of many economics, they're talking about 3% uh, growth, and that will require virtually, um, given the quarter one 7% drop, uh, mm -hmm. if we recover to last year's GDP in the second quarter, and you will have 8% growth in the second half of the year, then we'll get to about 3%, 2.9, you know, around 3%. Uh, now, my personal, uh, uh, assessment. I, I'm a little uh, pessimistic about this year's growth. I mean, I will tell you, I'm actually, I've been always quite optimistic about China's economy in the long run and the medium run, but right now, actually, I'm, I cannot be uh, optimistic. Uh, given the two earlier numbers I, I showed you, which I'm very much concerned. So I also did a calculation, I mean, based on my own assessment, I think the second quarter recover more rather than seven point, negative, you know, seven point drop or negative growth, maybe we'll recover to about, you know, close to full recovery, about 2%. And second half, we probably grow about 6%. The reason I'm using 6% is because I think at, before the whole thing broke up, people are expecting China may grow around 6%. Now with this uh, pandemic, uh, if we can maintain that growth with government support, I think would be good enough. So add together, if my projection, you know, turns out to be right, we'll probably have about 1.3% growth. So that's why I've been actually arguing that the government should not probably set a growth target this year. Let's, let's try to focus on the livelihood of ordinary people. Let's focus on the poverty issue and so on, rather than try to push for growth. All right, so um, now, even 1.3%, there are certain conditions. And I wanted to outline uh, uh, here, um, there are many actual conditions for that to be realized. One is this pandemic should end completely in China by mid of this year. Now, I think we more or less close it, but the impact I don't think will end by first half of the year. We're, we're lingering for maybe the third quarter, even possibly to the last quarter. But so this is, um, that's why I put the question mark there. I, I'm not fully uh, optimistic on that first condition. And second condition is because uh, we all know that, you know, China is part of the global economy. We, we are highly integrated, you know, the global economy. Although this last many years, we, we actually re reducing the dependence. I will show some numbers later on, but in any case, 
this global value chain is very important for China. And, and the global value chain will that resume in the second half of the year or by the end of this year. And again, this is a question mark. And if that's not going to happen, then that will drag down this Chinese economy further. The third question is the most small and medium enterprises, SMEs, because they host about 80% of Chinese employment. Because without this employment, they simply putting, dumping a lot of investment is not going to really lift China's, China's growth. And I don't have time to share that. Actually, I did some calculations. I mean, I'm going to share in some other workshops. Um, so we need really to maintain the employment. That's very important. That's my view. We have to maintain, if, if we have to suffer from more unemployment, we've got to try to minimize that, rather than really just use investment to, to, uh, to uh, push up growth. And then one assumption here is most SMEs can survive for six months. But again, we have surveys showing that's not the case. Now, of course, SMEs typically have a, you know, average life of about five years. So each year you have about 20% of them dying. But in usual circumstances, they will be replaced by others. You know, they take over, they buy, they set new. But in this year, I think it's a big question mark whether people were willing to take over a restaurant who is really you know, going to bankrupt. You know, the steamers, you know, they, if somebody wants to sell, anybody want to buy it. And uh, whether people will invest in setting up new small businesses. So that's also a big question mark. Then the fourth point is really the external situation. Um, I'm sure many of you probably is reading about it, and that's my concerns I'm going to share with you in the second half of uh, this talk, whether uh, we, we can maintain the current global environment for China's growth. I think, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a question mark. There's uh, certain changes, uh, events happening uh, globally, and, and that will certainly affect China's growth. And then I'm, I'm going, the, the fifth point I want to mention is uh, uh, Robert Barrow of Harvard University did a study recently published and showing the Spanish flu, the impact on the global economy on average is about 6 to 8% negative. So it's an impact. Now, China was growing, you know, 6 7% last year. Uh, and if we apply this simply, then we'll have negative growth. But of course, now we have government interventions, unlike, you know, uh, second, after the uh, First World War, the, the central government the economics still, you know, the macroeconomics did not have so much um, uh, uh, theory for, for interventions. But even given that, you know, if the government intervention can push up a couple of points, but um, I think we still sort of linger around 1%, maybe still 0%. So that's why I, I'm not optimist, optimistic with many of other um, projections about 3%. And I hope uh, the government will listen to uh, Many arguments saying we don't set a tax, growth tax of 3%. I mean, if it's going to be 1%, I don't think there is much point for us to really set a, a 1% point. And then, of course, uh, Professor uh, Chen Ziming just mentioned the IMF recently released a report. You know, before this uh, pandemic, IMF was projecting 3% growth on average for, for the global economy. Now it's, it's minus 3.3, <coughs> a uh, minus 3%. So it, it's a drop. In other words, IMF is saying there's an average more than 6% impact on the global economy. And I think on the Chinese economy, maybe even more than that. So uh, and final point I want to mention is IMF is says, saying if the second year of the uh, second half of 2020 is getting worse, um, then they were downgrade the projection to negative 6% rather than negative 3%. And that really means almost 10% impact on the global economy. Now, whether China can do much better, and I, I very much doubt it. Um, so given all that, I'm saying it is quite difficult for China to grow by 1.3%, which is my, you know, my uh, projection is already a, a little pessimistic than others, but I think we've got to be realistic, and that's very important for China and also for the global economy. And by the way, of course, the, the future of the pandemic, very much depending, we are all watching uh, two regions. One is India, and you know, I personally, I've been uh, uh, 
looking into in, uh, Indian economy for many, many, many years, for more than 10 years. I'm so much interested because I think uh, for China's growth, for the rise of Asia, India is so critical. And I also know India quite well. I, I travel there. I, I mean, I, I'm sure Indian government can do a great job. They, they do everything they could. The international community will support. But given the development status in India, it's a big right. I'm very, very much concerned. And of course, it's only just starting. Um, uh, in uh, India, and of course, we still also have Africa. So uh, overall, one um, percent, maybe even less than one percent growth in China. That's my own personal uh, uh, assessment. Now, before I come down to you know sort of medium, you know, beyond the pandemic, I you know I, I want to actually convey the information. I, I've been always optimistic about the Chinese government for many many years. You know, I give a talk in uh, the Kissinger Institute in. Uh, in Washington, I don't talk actually in, in European Union, uh, in the Commission as well. I, I've been saying Chinese company has huge potential to grow. Um, uh, but before I do that, I, I think people may ask a question. You know, keep, those who keep your eyes on the Chinese company will ask what happened because you know you see that's a that's a growth profile of the Chinese economy you know in post reform period, and you see. There is a you know sort of growth slowdown from 2007 2008 the global financial crisis and it's almost a linear drop over the cliff and and there's we don't see the the, the any sort of uh, recovering sign more than 10 years and 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 I want to I want to mention that there are points I've been arguing for many many years with uh, other economists with other institutions and I've been talking to some Chinese government as well. And I believe there is one issue um, for economists. Um, they drop down, the, the slowdown, we have to ask what caused slowdown and, and whether it's a supply side problem or demand side problem. And the Chinese government for the last many years has been really saying the supply is a problem. So we've been launching this supply side reform for quite a few years. And, and actually they, they downgrade, they actually overlook the demand side until now. So I'm happy because now that they are saying demand seems very important, they try to push up the demand and so on. And that's why I'm actually hopeful that the pandemic impact will be alleviated to some extent because the government is actually changing policy direction. And that's something I've been saying for years and years and years. And so um, there has been a growing slowdown, but the government now, only now start to change the policy and at least in my point of view, that's a good change. That's changing the right direction. It, it hopefully, you know, we're, it will help to uh, uh, to uh, 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 offset the panic, pandemic impact. And, and given the policy change, hopefully in the future, let me talk about the long-term or medium-term growth in the Chinese uh, uh, economy. Now, as I said, and I've been saying this for, for many, many years, China has huge potential to grow. Despite the fact that we've been growing for 40 years, you know, more than 10, 9 percent, which is, you know, unprecedented in the in the uh, in in uh, in a uh, human history. Um, this is a chart I wanted to show you because uh, uh, my argument, I, you know, you can build up economic models to try to make the argument, but but I want to do a very simple model everybody can understand, because in economics there are three major agents, right? We have individuals. We have firms, we have government, right? Now, if the three agents all do their job well, of course, the, the economy can grow. And here is the evidence, okay? I can tell you, and I think most of you will agree with me, Chinese individuals are most hardworking. And, and it's been thousands of years, you know, we all, Chinese are known to be hardworking. So, and individuals are okay. And Chinese also have entrepreneurship. So they can run firms, companies, and you only have to travel anywhere. You know, you go to, you know, other, other parts of Asia, you go to Europe, you go to Latin America, you go to even Africa. Chinese can set up firms and so on and so on. And, uh, and so the only other part is the government. So what I'm saying, if the government is doing a good job in China, then we'll have good growth, we can expect. And here's a chart showing that in the last thousand years, that's the share. This chart shows the share of the Chinese economy in the global economy, of China in the global economy. So in the last thousand years, until recently, 
until very recently, you know, China has accounted for almost 30% of the global economy. Now, what caused the recent slowdown or the decline? Well, most Chinese know is even high school students, because in Ming and Qing Dynasty, they, they closed the country or they shut down the country. Right? Like now, they shut down the country, they, 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 they disconnected from the rest of the world. So that's the one contrast I wanted to show. If the government doing a good job, open up the country, collaborate uh, with others, um, then China can grow because we have hardworking people, we have entrepreneurship. And the other contrast I want to tell you, and also you know, is the, the you know, before reform and after reform, after the, in the People's Republic period. So before reform, we have slow growth. Well, because the government has been, you know, they, they were many engaged in, in class struggle. And after reform, we, we focus our attention on economic development. So we have seen this uh, growth miracle in the Chinese economy. Uh, so, uh, so we do have growth potential from, you know, from that perspective, from these two contrasts. But also, uh, uh, if you want to talk about economics, I can tell you we have huge, we have, you know, huge potential to grow because we still have factor gaps. Uh, our uh, per capita capital is about uh, uh, one eighth of the United States. Um, come even with Europe, one sixth of the of Europe. Uh, our schooling, average schooling, is about nine years, still far behind Europe and America. And besides, we have huge savings, um, so we do have capital, and, and we have the opportunity to invest capital. And and another thing I want to mention is China still has about forty percent of rural population, and the the marginal product, you know, in economics, you know, they, that at the margin they produce virtually nothing. And, and China has been gaining from this uh, transformation from farming to industrial to, uh, to industrialization and, and the service dominated industry. And, and we do still have potential to do that. And also we have huge urban rural gap between the urban economy and, and the rural economy. We also have regional gaps. China is a big country, as you know, the coast area like where Shanghai is, is very much developed. I mean, our GDP is about more than 20,000 US dollars now, but, but average is only $10,000. So, and it, given this gap, it means potential. In economics, we have this convergence theory. Uh, and, and for, you know, rural economy, uh, for the rural people to catch up with the urban people, for the inland people catch up with the coast. And the final point I want to mention is this productivity gap between China and the frontier of the world, or US, Europe, and Japan. And that's the point I want to show you uh, a, a, a chart. Here is the productivity gap between China and other economies. And China has been gaining from this gap by catching up, by learning from the advanced economies, including Europe. And that's where actually I'm very much concerned. That's the second part I'm going to uh, share with you my concerns, because whether we can continue to, um, to uh, utilize or take advantage of this gap or the convergence. The first concern is the globalization. Now, COVID-19 is a temporary shock, but if that doesn't cause structural changes in the Chinese economy or globally, then China can grow as I just outlined. But the trouble is whether that's gonna be the case. And the first one is the globalization, which has been happening and we've been discussing. And I want to show you uh, 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 this, uh, uh, one is in English, one in Chinese. Now, I'm not saying it's going to, you know, materialize, but certainly there are events happening which will impact the Chinese economy. Japan announced a uh, $200 million package to help the, their factories to relocate back. Now, I'm not saying just targeting China, but certainly will affect China if that, that's going to happen. Then U.S., I, I'm sure, you know, you, you probably read about it. Uh, they haven't announced the package, but they certainly have been saying that uh, for a while. Now, I don't think they're going to have the full impact or they, um, they stop the investment, they're going to relocate it back, but that will produce potential impact um, on the Chinese economy. So the, that's my first concern, whether the globalization <coughs> will push further and because China has been growing from the globalization. The second part is beyond economics. The, the global order. And I'll, I put these two charts here. One is this, uh, uh, this is by the, the US Congress uh, and, the, and President Trump actually joined that seminar. 
and they are trying to com compare the mortality rate between China and other countries. As an economist, I I'm sure those uh, audience were all would be also surprised. I mean, that doesn't make much sense at all. Now, for those who are interested, you can search on the website. There are people doing a comparison between United States and Hong Kong. The Hong Kong close to China, uh, and uh, you know the, we have more people traveling to Hong Kong, and so on and so on. Hong Kong's mortality rate is much much lower than the United States. And uh, what I'm saying is uh, is is because you know there are things. Beyond economics, we've got to be concerned. And that, that, of course, will have an impact on the Chinese economy. Not mentioning uh, President Trump uh, scratched the virus and replaced by Chinese virus and, and caused uh, a big concern of the international community. So uh, whether there's, you know, the non-economic impact, um, uh, you know, how that will affect Chinese economy. And that's my concern for many years, actually. You know, since about 2009, I've been saying, we, we, you know, the China-Sino-U.S. relationship is very important, and and you know both countries and the international community must try to manage that. And and finally, I wanted to mention the, you know, that people are talking about global order at this uh, uh, sort of very special time, um, and the people are being complaining about lack of global leadership. You now that's the current state. I'm I'm actually concerned whether it's going to get getting worse or it's getting better. And the second point I want to mention is people are saying, uh, certainly, um, you, you, you know, some groups are saying China is, you know, confirmed in the United States. I'm saying no, because if you look at the last leadership transition between the UK and the United States, it took more than, more than 50 years after U.S. become the largest economy, in, both in terms of total volume and also per capita. Now, for China to become the largest economy, particularly in, in per capita terms, it will take 50 and 70 years. So if we are going to talk about China confronting the United States, we talk about 80 years or, or perhaps 100 years. So that's still far away. And then some people are concerned about the silver structure. And I'm saying, you know, you got to just look, uh, you know, I, I, I want to emphasize China is uh, being um, insisting on non allies policy since the 1960s. And whether, you know, we don't really even, you know, uh, consider allies. Um, whether in, in, in the UN or in G20. Uh, so the global order um, is under, um, I guess, you know, uh, uh, we, we're having uh, challenges with the current global order, the world order. And post COVID-19, I'm very much concerned because the United States has pulled out UNESCO, which is the educational arm. WTO more or less is in coma, if not dead, and also because of US and that's economic arm of the world order. And then WHO, we all know, uh, we'll see the fate, and I'm not very optimistic. Uh, and, uh, you know, in the end, I'm concerned about the UN system. And, and so we all got to watch this global order. But despite that, uh, if things getting worse, on all these things I, I sort of developing not to China's favor, China will still continue to grow. Maybe the growth will be slower. Uh, the reason I just give uh, already a bit, uh, bit earlier. And I wanted to show this chart, uh, this table because uh, uh, China, uh, EU, EU and US has been China's largest uh, trade partners for many, many years. But things are changing. If you look at this chart, that's quarter. I mean, it, it, it's not a, you know, it's not a long run, but I just want to alert uh, our audience, our friends here. Look at this chart here. That's quarter one China's trade. So if you look at this now, ASEAN is 15.1%, which is number one. EU dropped to the second position. Uh, EU actually used to be the number one, about 20 to 23% of China's trade. US is about 20. Um, and then we have ASEAN. Now things are changed. EU, uh, ASEAN, 15%, EU, 13%. US from around 20% dropped to 10%. And I, I also wanted to focus your attention to the last line. That's the Belt Road countries. So we actually have an increase of trade with Belt Road countries in this difficult time by 3%. Three, three and Belt Road countries altogether accounts for almost one third of China's trade already. So China is, is changing, the world is changing, changing China is changing as well. Uh, and China still has the potential to grow. And here is another chart to, to share with you, which is the economic dependence between China and the rest of the world. 
If you, if you see that in 2000, the, the, the black column is the China's, uh, the black column is the dependence of world on the Chinese economy. So in 2000, you know, the world doesn't really very much depend on China. On the other hand, China depends very much on the world by the indicator, or you know, you look at the value, you know, the dependence actually doubled. China is uh, sort of a, have you know, 0.8 dependence on the world, but the world uh, uh, depend on China is, is only 0.4. But if you look at 2017, things change completely. It's just totally reversed. The world depends on China. The, the, the indicator is 1.2. China dependence on the world also increased, but it's only 0.6. So I want to alert you this interdependence is very important. It is important for China, but it's all also very important uh, for the world. I think I should stop here because of the time, but if later on we have time to discuss, I can share um, more on the e EU-China possibilities, collaboration, feasibility, and the prospect. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you very much for this presentation. So now we will invite our Professor Dean Chun, who will focus on Sino EU collaboration in fighting the pandemic and possible economic recessions. So, Dean Professor, you ready? I'll show you the slide. 看到了吗? Okay. So good afternoon, Aya. Uh, I'm very honored to be invited here to uh, talking about the Sino-EU economic relations and the COVID-19. Uh, actually, uh, my points were as follows. Ah, yeah. So the first is uh, economic response to COVID-19 from both from China and also from the European side. And second, uh, the shock or the hit of the COVID-19 to uh, Chinese uh, and uh, to Sino-EU uh, economic relations, and then the Sino-European uh, economic cooperation and also uh, prospects. Uh, the first <laughs> uh, graph is just show the map of uh, uh, China yeah, actually, uh, as you all know that uh, at one side, uh, we maintain the pandemic of COVID-19. Yeah, so uh, with a slogan, guarding against imported case from abroad while preventing a re residence of the outbreak at home. That's on one hand. On the other hand, uh, we gradually to uh, keep yeah, the uh, economic activities so here, till the end of last month, uh, actually totally 98.6% uh, 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 of major industry firms or enterprises nationwide had restarted. So here you can see the, the, the map, uh, which are highlighted in blue, yeah, with the deep blue, which means uh, actually that's concentrate more uh, in the eastern part uh, uh, along the coastline. Uh, which means that uh, it almost reaches full capacity. So regarding uh, actually the Chinese government uh, economic policy, I will say that uh, first we have the monetary measures, which actually provide financial support, yeah, especially to keep market durability. And uh, for example, here we cut reserve requirement ratio for small and medium-sized banks by almost 100 basis points. And when people are talking about fiscal measures, here you can see at first we cut the taxes and also administrative fees, also including to uh, reductions of the uh, social contribution. And totally for the first two months, it's uh, account for almost 400 billion INB. And we also raise export rebate uh, rates for more than uh, thousand types of products starting uh, from March 20s. And also buffered the blow to the supply chain. Uh, for this, we established 46 new cross-border e-commerce pilot zones, while also the local government's different level have work resumptions for 
uh, both Chinese and also uh, foreign uh, companies. So here I can also give the experience, uh, give the example that uh, Chinese side also uh, invites the EU Chamber of Commerce in China to discuss uh, about how to uh, keep the economic activities going. And besides on this, I mean, uh, contain this pandemic, we also continue to deep our reform and opening up. So here you can see that on the 1st April, foreign ownership caps on security firms were scrapped. And also we are uh, setting up uh, or speeding up more these kind of industry projects uh, to promote, uh, to boosting the economic, economic activities. Totally, we have 21 provincial level region intended to advance 5G net uh, work constructions. So that's uh, more about the economic uh, policies or measures which undertaken by Chinese side. And then we uh, let's uh, have a look at the measures which undertaken by European side. So here, uh, first we uh, we can see that uh, yeah, from the monetary uh, aspect. Uh, ECB has launched these uh, new QE projects. Uh, actually, that's uh, the implementation of pandemic emergency purchase program uh, with totally 715 billion uh, euros, uh, which is quite a pumping uh, money. And uh, here I just pick up these uh, graphs from the uh, website of the European Commission. Here you can see uh, from fiscal measures, uh, for fiscal measures, uh, together with member states, EU totally uh, raised account uh, for about uh, 3,319 uh, billion euros, uh, which actually uh, based on the, the support projects uh, by member states and also by uh, European commissions. Uh, here I think these uh, national liquidity measures together with uh, uh, 200 billion uh, Euro EIB, which means a, a European Investment Bank financing for business, are focusing more on uh, the enterprises, especially focusing on the uh, SMEs. And then here, uh, uh, these uh, uh, ESM projects, which is also, I think, very important, uh, that could be regarded as one of these integrated uh, financial measures against this uh, pandemic, especially with these people could have uh, the countries like uh, Italy and uh, Spain and these kind of uh, European member states, which actually hit heavily by this pandemic. Uh, the last one, but not least, I think these uh, SURE projects, which focus more on those short time worker schemes, which actually learn from the experience of Germany, I think it's very uh, useful to, to maintain those uh, jobs. So that's uh, uh, actually this graph also shows those uh, fiscal measures which implemented by the different member states. Uh, maybe the, the graph is so small you can do not uh, read the details of this. But uh, as a principle, you can see here first focusing more on this uh, medical IND, uh, especially I think that's for the promotion of uh, the research and development focusing on this vaccine and also the state uh, guarantee loan for those payment delay and also for uh, employment aid uh, schemes which is very important i think so for me i think uh, the two main major concerns for the long term of uh, european economy number one is this public debt burden yeah, because uh, as we all know that uh, according to this uh, st stability and growth pact, uh, the cap for the public debt should not exceed 60% of total GDP. But as uh, I know that uh, by the end of last year, uh, this ratio for Italy is all already 137%, for Spain almost 100% uh, around, for France even, yeah, it's almost around 100%. Uh, so that, that means if people yeah, use these kind of uh, yeah, I mean, uh, fiscal deficits, it could be no doubt uh, accumulate more of these uh, public debts, which could lead to uh, maybe another uh, sovereign debt crisis if we could not 
and withdraw these kind of things afterwards. Yeah. So that's one concern which I really uh, take serious. The second is uh, about these uh, so-called supply chain risks. Yeah. If the pandemic uh, keep long, yeah, not yeah, uh, under the control in a very short term, yeah, then we will have also problem with this uh, disruption of uh, uh, supply chain. So that's the first point. Yeah, actually, that's uh, uh, the uh, economic policies from both sides against this uh, COVID-19. Second point, very brief, about the these kind of hit or negative impact of, from COVID-19 uh, against uh, the financial trade between China and European member states. So here you can see the trade declines very uh, heavily. Yeah, for the first two months this year, Chinese foreign uh, trade was dropped by 6.4%. In detail, yeah, uh, between EU and China, yeah, the trade with uh, Chinese trade with EU dropped by 10.4%. So, uh, which means that uh, the, by import side, that's minus 9.9%. Export, that's quite heavily, that's 17.1%, which narrowed the surplus from Chinese side to so-called uh, 34 percent, yeah, and that's also leads to the results that EU's position was replaced by ASEAN as China's largest trading par trading partner for the first two months this year. And uh, for in this very special or very difficult time, I think the bilateral cooperation is still there. Yeah, as we all know that uh, from China, uh, from European side, we also received uh, the uh, EU medical supplies to, to Chinese side when the pandemic was spoke out in Wuhan at the uh, beginning as the first wave. And the second wave when the uh, European Union uh, and uh, uh, which is member states were hit by this pandemic, the Chinese medical supplies together with Chinese medical teams was also, yeah, uh, leapers to, to Europe, which I think was appreciated by both sides. And here I also want, uh, want to mention a very uh, uh, significant point. Yeah, uh, when people are talking about the logistics, which is actually uh, stagnated during this period, that's China, China Railway Express between China and uh, European countries, because uh, totally 18 European countries was involved yeah, here you can see we have a new record, uh, which I mean that uh, uh, from January to March, totally we have uh, 1941 trends, which increased by 15% compared to the first quarter of last year. Then I will uh, switch to the third uh, point, which I want to mention. That's more about uh, actually the development of economic tie between uh, EU China and also the prospects. Yeah, before this pandemic, no doubt this pandemic is uh, external uh, shock. Yeah, uh, as normal, you can see here the graphs just show you the when people are talking about trade in goods uh, between China and uh, uh, EU, that's quite clear. It's keep growth with years. Here, China is EU's second largest trade partner, while EU is China's largest trade partner. And then when we have a look at the trading service, that's a little bit just opposite of which I want to say that uh, in these terms, I mean trading service, uh, European side is always ha has always a surplus, yeah, so, and also with always uh, with this very uh, uh, big uh, speed growth. And when people are talking about technology transfer. No doubt, uh, EU and EU member states is the main source for Chinese uh, high tech or technology transfer. And when people are talking about uh, FDI, so here these uh, uh, two graphs just show you the uh, recent trend. Uh, first is the, the growth of Chinese FDI into EU. You can see uh, we reached a peak in the year 2016, and then when we have a look at EU outwards FDI to, towards China, that's always keep uh, growing. And then I actually I want to say something about uh, Chinese uh, uh, policy, which 
and we keep on uh, deepening our opening up policy. Yeah, here you can see uh, because actually we have received concerns from the Ping side, from the uh, United States, from Japan, from these kind of uh, high uh, industrialized entities. Uh, so as a response to, toward this, so we established a free trade zone uh, first in Shanghai, that was in year 2015. So the target for establishment of this free trade zone is to narrow the gap, the concerns from outside and the status quo of Chinese economic development. So here I just give the example here, you can see in this table, the always shortening uh, negative list for market access, which means that we give more and more free hand for the foreign investors. The reforms in the fields of financial sector, uh, financial sector uh, in in the fields of uh, uh, IPR and also in the fields of uh, uh, investment. So here you also know that uh, last year we issued this uh, new foreign investment law, which clearly uh, forbidden that the forced transfer of technical knowledge uh, for, uh, from those kind of foreign investors to to Chinese side, and we have. Uh, promote, um, uh, prefer more legislation rather than uh, approvals. Yeah. So these are actually the measures which uh, we implemented. Uh, we want to keep our economic reform. And uh, as a result, here you can see in this graph, that's the improvement in the Chinese business environment. So according to this, to this ease of doing business, which actually issued by uh, the World Bank doing business 2019, you can see the uh, very heavy drop uh, of uh, the barriers and also the ranking of China uh, is on the rise in the uh, ease of doing business, which means that we have made really a very good progress when people talking about these kind of business environments. And another uh, example is just uh, few days ago that we have this new uh, actually uh, ranking and Shanghai overtook Singapore uh, ranking fourth in the global financial centers uh, centers uh, index. So that's actually about the Chinese efforts to uh, do more uh, in keeping our economic reform. Yeah, for the future cooperation with EU, I think we have already uh, this kind of mechanism and also platform. Uh, for example, we have this EU-China connectivity uh, platform, which actually uh, had in 2015. Uh, we have these two tools, AIB and also EBRD, which uh, actually we have uh, the bridge or have this instrument. instrument. Yeah. We have also uh, the potential synergy but possibility between the Belt and Road Initiative, and also the EU's Euro-Asia connectivity uh, strategy. So last but not least, I want to mention uh, the importance of Luxembourg uh, within actually the economic tie between EU and China. So we all know that Luxembourg becomes more important for Sino-EU co co cooperation, especially after Brexit, especially for the uh, financial sectors. Yeah. So here, uh, maybe you can also see some detailed uh, events or, or affairs, which I want to uh, list it here that uh, uh, to demonstrate the cooperation between Luxembourg and China in the fields of financial sectors. Yeah, And uh, also we have this privilege that uh, uh, last year, Luxembourg also signed an MOU with China under the Belt and Road Initiative. And we all know that Luxembourg is first European country which joined AIIB. So all this, uh, yeah, no doubt, uh, means that Luxembourg is playing a very important role for the Sino-EU economic pact. So as a conclusion remarks, uh, I would say both China and Europe are trying their best to help their economy admit COVID-19 impact. Second, Sino-EU economic relations are the anchor of Sino-EU relations. Despite concerns, I think Sino-EU economic relations still have great potential. Uh, and also Luxembourg is a gateway uh, to Sino-EU economic cooperation. 
Finally, I would say all the best to Europe and China, especially in, to the, uh, in, during these very uh, difficult times. Yeah, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ding. And many thanks also to Professor Wang for this uh, uh, brilliant um, lectures. So, uh, as promised, we move now to the uh, part number three of this uh, webinar with a um, discussion. Uh, where, of course, we invite all participants to send in questions by the chat function on your YouTube channel. And these questions will be forwarded to our speakers. On the side of Luxembourg University, I uh, welcome down on the plateau um, Sylvain Stentamont, um, who is uh, head of our International Relations Office. And uh, uh, Professor Christos, do we have his uh, picture here? No. Sorry, I got lost. Uh, yeah, Professor Christos Kukulovakianos, uh, who is a specialist uh, for economy, of course. So, uh, Sylvain Christos, if you would perhaps take the lead of the discussion. Uh, I could start if you if you allow me a bit. I mean, can you can you hear me first of all? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. So uh, first of all, I would like to thank you very much for these uh, presentations. I received one presentation yesterday, and I must say that I was quite uh, not exactly surprised, but um, I was very much interested in seeing uh, the numbers in China. And uh, let me mention that uh, when you look at the drop in the growth rate, you have to calculate from what was expected, which was about 6%. Uh, so uh, already the impact uh, for a country that has taken immediate measures and has been very successful in the containment of the crisis seems to be uh, very uh, severe. Uh, so let me a bit introduce myself. Uh, I'm a professor in finance and uh, the reason I have been invited to participate is because I'm also a member among the nine colleagues from the economics and finance department who participate in the task force of uh, the Luxembourgish government against the economic impact of the COVID-19 crisis. And uh, I must say that my role in this task force is to is the is, is the most ugly one is to speak about the worst case scenarios. <laughs> yeah. Correct about the scenario of a financial crisis. And uh, let me uh, say, make one re remark and start with a few questions. Uh, first of all, the task force in Luxembourg did exactly the same as what you did. We looked at uh, the study by Barrow. Uh, we looked at similar studies that have um, a uh, look at scenarios of the epidemic, of the pandemic. And uh, then we tried to see the interplay between the economy and uh, different scenarios of the, of the development of the pandemic. And uh, so we started with projections looking at past numbers. So the remark about it is that you can rely on this particular method. It is the place to start. We all start from that. You can rely on uh, this methodology uh, only under one assumption that all the structure of the economy stays in place that the most important structural features of the economy are there. Uh, the problem we face in the 21st century, and actually only just 12 years after the previous global crisis, is that we are swimming in debt. Not only the enterprises are very much indebted, uh, the banks are trying to survive a debt situation in the world, in the Western world, uh, but also the governments, especially in the EU, as you saw. And 
Uh, I must tell you that I'm also, I come from Greece, so I come from the country which is the most indebted, in, its state is the most indebted. Of course, the Greek state is, the Greek state debt right now uh, comes mostly from the ESM, so it is pretty much insured. The figure on Italy is from markets which can be scary. Here is the point. What we have been trying to do in our research is to get data on the debt network of companies and banks. Uh, we are unaware of uh, who are the key players. When you are hit by a crisis like this, you have to uh, understand that there's disruption in production might take down a lot of companies because of their debt, and of course, also government. So you have to understand who can, who you can afford to let fall or become smaller in size. In this case, uh, what we want to prevent is uh, a big hit in the structure of the economy. Uh, if you lose key companies in production, or if you start losing banks and you have to rescue them, you have to see this coming and put money on the table. This is systemic risk, first of all. You have to put money on the table, enough money credibly, so as to prevent a coordinated panic of the markets. What you have seen in the American stock market dropping so fast, it can be repeated and it can go down even more. And we all know that it's easy when markets easy for markets to coordinate on the way down, but it takes a long time to coordinate on the way up. So uh, the bad news and the aspect I want to bring is the following. Uh, as Professor Dink very correctly mentioned, uh, we have an upgrade of the European stability mechanism in Europe, uh, the European Investment Bank, all the existing infrastructure is in place in order to put money on the table and to credibly convince the markets, the biggest force, uh, to stay as calm as possible, stay as calm and wait. So uh, the worst case scenario would be blowing up debts, which would affect the world economy. And uh, they could, uh, of course, decrease very much the demand for Chinese products. So this is exactly the dependence of um, China from the rest of the world right now, the demand. The question to you is the following. Um, we have to think, in my view, on coordinated views, on coordinated actions across leaders of countries on how to uh, prevent a global financial crisis again. And my question to you is, uh, are you taking action uh, against this, because of course here in Europe we take action at the national level, speaking to the Euro Parliament, but we would like also to encourage the Euro Parliament, the European Parliament, uh, to uh, take global action at the level of G8, G20. And the last thing, the last uh, remark and comment is that in a better case scenario, for sure, debt markets will be influenced. And uh, if it is markets where you want it to be markets because governments do not have the size to replace the markets, uh, Luxembourg is, of course, an ideal place to play a role in these markets by providing um, to know how and providing essentially at least a European market and, of course, a global market as well. This was mostly a remark. Thank you. Okay.那教授们，我这边简单的总结一下，呃，就是嗯，这边有一个问题，就是说，呃，这个中国作为这个世界强国，嗯，在不管是在经济领域还是政治领域，都起到了一个很好的协调员的作用。那么这个COVID
，您认为我们能够采取哪些嗯步骤，可以防止或者说阻止这个这个金融危机的发生？谢谢。Uh, maybe, maybe. Uh, my response is uh, thank you very much for these uh, remarks. Uh, I totally agree that uh, under these uh, circumstances, especially with uh, these kind of pandemic of uh, COVID-19, uh, really we need uh, to organize these kind of uh, cooperation or coordination, like uh, we uh, have already experienced during this uh, uh, financial crisis ten years ago. Uh, that G20, uh, together with Uh, for example, IMF or World Bank, uh, people could uh, do something to uh, actually uh, to reduce these kind of risks. Yeah, which uh, Professor has already mentioned that uh, it could could be lead uh, to the collapse of the government of uh, enterprises. Actually, I think uh, in every uh, national state, uh, the government has already done these kind of efforts. To give the guarantee for for the loans for the credit, just to keep these uh, uh, enterprises uh, survive. Uh, also, uh, by us in China, the government uh, different level has done quite a lot of uh, efforts uh, to do this. For example, here in Shanghai, the、uh, municipal government has、uh, take these kind of measures. For example, to reduce or or fewer、uh, the rent. For those, uh, yeah, uh, small uh, enterprises or shops, for example, I think uh, in uh, European continent it's almost the same that、uh, the sectors like aviation, like、uh, gastronomy, like uh, entertainment, uh, as well as uh, 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 tourism, was hit so heavily by this kind of uh, uh, pandemic. I, I mean, for the first wave, yeah. So.、Uh, If、uh, not only at the, the state level, we need to、uh, these kind of a coordination or cooperation、uh, at the level like、uh, at the platform like、uh, G8, G7, or G20. But also, yeah,、uh, in micro level, I think、uh, each government should do this to keep、uh, at first、uh, SME or the other kinds of uh, uh, enterprises survive. And then to keep、uh, the people's livelihood, yeah,、uh, that's very important because that's the per- first hit. Yeah, if we could not overcome these kind of difficulties, then we will have problem. Not only,、uh, yeah, I mean, in some countries, but also worldwide. Yeah, maybe that's a very uh, primary uh, response from from my side. Thank you very much.、Um, I just want to. To uh, uh, mention, uh, chi- uh, I think people has been worrying about China's debt problem for many many years. But things actually were getting better before the current、uh, outbreak of, of pandemic.、Uh, so China still have munitions, have the space to uh, uh, to increase debt, and actually China is doing that right now. So I think you, you probably saw that.、Uh, that's the first point.、Uh, I, I want to mention the, the second point is you also know that、uh, the high debt in China、uh, largely at the local government level.、Uh, a lot of that in, in the local government level, but central government is is quite okay. And also China has a lot of set assets. I mean, you you also know the the economy. Forty percent of the economy is you know、uh, largely based、uh, related to the state-owned enterprises, state assets. So、uh, the the chance of Uh, crisis、uh, in China is, I mean, I'm not saying totally、um, impossible, but it's pretty low,、uh, despite the fact many economists in, in you know, in, particularly in the, in the United States, has been predicting that for years and years and years, and and I don't think that that's going to happen. And finally, um, um, as Professor Dean just mentioned, in last、uh, global financial crisis, China、uh, injected four trillion. Chinese renminbi into the economy to I mean, help China, but also help the world. Now there are economists in China suggesting 10 trillion this year. Now whether that's going to happen or not, we will wait and see in a few days. I mean, I, I mean, if you ask my personal view, I'm not in favor of it. 
Uh, but if you ask whether they're, you know, China will do something this time, I think certainly something will be done, but whether it's ten trillion or something else, but China uh, will uh, take measures. And, and there's little chance, I mean, pretty low probability for, for crisis to happen in China. Yeah, maybe one uh, uh, added question uh, to you that uh, we all know that there is a very heated debate uh, among the so-called Southern European member states and Northern European uh, member states about these uh, corona uh, bonds or euro bonds. Uh, yeah, as economics, we all know that behind this, maybe that's the uh, moral hazard. Uh, and uh, yeah, my question is uh, like this. So uh, in your point of view, is it enough? Because we have already quite, uh, yeah, I mean, this kind of uh, funding measures uh, or we have this uh, ESM or these kind of things. So uh, in your point of view, is it, is it enough? Uh, I mean, <laughs> with uh, the, the, the measures we are undertaking now is uh, within e the EU. And uh, my personal point of view, it's very good that this time the uh, federal government of Germany give up their austerity policy and they really want to have uh, some uh, very active fiscal policy, which I think is also uh, have the other member states. Yeah. So what's your, your, your comment about this? Yeah, thank you for both uh, comments. I will only make a first remark about uh, China. Um, I would, uh, I'm not uh, a deep expert in China. I have uh, co-authorships and uh, collaborations. I don't know the state of the Chinese economy deeply. I have been debating with uh, a lot of people about uh, one fact that when, uh, which we know in finance very well, when you grow very, very fast, uh, it is uh, very easy to fall into a debt trap. I do understand and I know that uh, the, um, uh, that China has a lot of space for issuing more debt, but uh, a, a, an enormous drop in the, uh, in the growth rate. So if you fall from 6% to, let's say, in a, in a scenario where the Chinese economy has to slow down to 0 to 1% for two, three years, uh, one will have to think about uh, debt as well. I, I, your point is very well taken, but uh, uh, you must also look at the Japanese experience as well. Uh, one of the reasons why Japan was hit so badly uh, 23 years ago was exactly because uh, it was growing very fast and its uh, banking, all its debt system had adapted to that. Uh, this is only a remark. It's only a, a point that also in China, I think one must be alert. Uh, so, uh, to answer to Professor Ding, uh, you are perfectly right, uh, the issues of moral hazard we have been uh, studying and uh, we are aware of that. Uh, actually, uh, I will also say that in the European Stability Mechanism uh, there will be um, a conference in October, but uh, it's already uh, scheduled on exactly these issues on the architecture of the euro, of the ESM, and the moral hazard issues with Professor Ramon Marimon. I hope that we will be able to have it also online uh, with Victorious Rue, Laguerre for Princeton, people who will speak exactly about this. Uh, let me make a clarification. Um, what uh, my team has been recommending is not to spend uh, the trillions but mostly to show the trillions and commit some of them as a lender of last resort, not as someone who simply gives away in terms of fiscal, um, uh, you know, injections. Because uh, another important point to make is that fiscal multipliers, think about the, uh, the policy of Germany right now, fiscal multipliers will, wor will not work in the same way as in normal times. Uh, an, an underlying uh, fear of the markets for investments will, um, of course, the, uh, spending sp fiscally now in order to alleviate the pain and to buy time to the private markets uh, is very important, but uh, I think nobody should expect to have the multiplier effect that we usually cal calculate at normal times. 
So what my team has been recommending is to credibly put the money on the table, to show the money so as, as a preventive measure so that the markets, who are the biggest player in investment, do not pull out, of, uh, pull out their investments out of productive places to store then the wealth in gold, for example, which is unproductive because we know that it can take just one week to create an incredible liquidity problem to any economy and then it can take years for markets to coordinate in order to put the money back in productive investments even when the opportunities are very good so this is exactly the uh, the point i was taking and uh, i welcome uh, very much the fact that you uh, agree and that you publicly say that the attitude of China in the previous crisis and the willingness of China uh, in uh, this crisis is of course to cooperate it's in the interest of everyone China and the rest of the world uh, to simply show a coordinated action the remark I wanted to make is that it is uh, the duty on the side of the academics to mention these things and another duty we have is to uh, also declare that there are many things about a crisis that we don't understand. There are no crisis models that are uh, uh, accepted uh, globally. The same also with the growth uh, theories. We know uh, that uh, growth you know, can be uh, technology adoption, technology creation. It can be also factor growth. Uh, it's all the uh, points made by uh, Professor Wong. Um, uh, we have limited knowledge there. And in the new world where we will wake up, uh, it's, it is very good. I'm, I'm sure that China and everybody else will have to uh, reconsider the growth uh, model. Uh, and uh, in, I think our job is to... Uh, help the economy improve after this uh, particular uh, COVID-19 crisis. We have to fix things. One last uh, comment is that a crisis is a Greek word and it doesn't mean disaster. Crisis means, uh, you know, from mathematics, it's the critical point. Crisis means that you can go up or down. It's a judgment day. So it's either an opportunity to become better, maybe painful, uh, or uh, a road to depression. So crisis doesn't mean disaster. <laughs> yeah, sure. Today I agree. <laughs> Could I perhaps uh, come back to one of your comments about the um, opening up of the economy and the role of the government in doing it in a transition? I think I hope that our American friends are listening, uh, by the way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Last week, we, we learned from your practice uh, on the medical side, because you're a few months ahead of us, what could you share with us as lessons in the opening up of the economy? How, how can, at the mac micro level, what our government can learn from your government in mitigating the impact? And, and, and congratulations for the presentation. I'm not an economist, and I thought it was fascinating. Thank you. Mm. Uh, yeah. Let me let me say a few words. I'm not an expert. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think it's uh, uh, very important is that um, you need uh, um, contained virus in a crucial way. So if that um, um, the outbreak, you know, links on, then people might not have the full confidence uh, in normalizing the economy uh, because that might create another uh, new waves and new peaks. Uh, so I think in China is that um, you, you are willing in the very beginning uh, that um, to impose on a very tough, you know, decision to lock down uh, 10 million of people a uh, city uh, so we, that's why you were hit uh, very hard uh, in Hubei province the first quarter GDP is done by 40 percent so that is a kind of a 
country of European size. Right? Uh, so you you're willing to uh, to to confront the hard, big uh, cost of uh, you know bold measures uh, to strict measures uh, to contain the uh, uh, the outbreak. Uh, so now we are in a much better situation. You are, as uh, Professor Dean Chun talked about, there's 97% uh, of the business uh, coming back uh, uh, to their business. Uh, so that might be uh, one thing, uh, but it's uh, maybe also very Chinese because uh, you look at the United States that the president is supporting those people uh, to lose, <laughs> to loosen uh, the quarantine uh, measures. Um, the other thing is that um, um, you you need to be very quick, adaptive. You know, uh, we heard that like uh, before the outbreak, the Chinese uh, production right of masks, like uh, per day, is what. 30 million or 20, 20, million. 20, million 20 million per day, right? 20 million masks per day. But after that, to serve the, uh, the huge demand in China, then they build up so many uh, big, huge uh, mask factories and they start to build all the mask machines, right? One of the super machine is like uh, producing uh, a thousand masks at one minute. Uh, so now we, I, I don't know, people, they're talking about maybe 50, 500 million masks per day. It's false. So that's why in the past two months, that uh, <laughs> a, a, apart from meeting the demand in China, uh, and they can able to almost export uh, 4 billion masks uh, to the outside the world. Uh, almost uh, like 40 uh, million uh, gowns, protective gowns uh, to the rest of the world. So which can help uh, the other countries to uh, having this PPE and uh, to fight against the, the COVID-19. So which means that is an example that how the private business and also the government guidance uh, incentives uh, to push the economy, right, to uh, the, the business sector and moving to those areas that you have the huge demand, uh, even at this difficult time. Right. So, uh, yeah, adaptability, uh, which means also uh, what kind of resilience, mm -hmm. right, yes. is also very important. Uh, but I think in the future that the, all the economies might be thinking about the question that whether in the past this globalization is uh, too too much, or we are we are you know we don't set any limits on the uh, production chain uh, in the global uh, world. Uh, so we might shorten the uh, production chain, and um, then um, you know some kind of. Uh, retreat of globalization, I think it's uh, inevitable uh, as what we have seen also in the last se several years as uh, yes. Professor Wan's, uh, you know, curves already told you that uh, we are uh, the excessive de uh, dependence on the international market uh, is going down, right? So we are becoming more normal, uh, like uh, trading uh, countries. Uh, but that that might be uh, the direction that uh, we are also going. Uh, but at this time, uh, we think it is very important that countries around the world, they need to work uh, with each other. Uh, when uh, the professor talked about the Chinese role in uh, helping or working with the world uh, to uh, fight against this uh, future global financial crisis, I think it is very important that uh, all the countries, particularly the big uh, company, uh, big countries, big economies, they need to work together. But now we see this is not the case. Uh, look at what the, uh, the 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 Trump government is treating China. Right? They are still putting 
so much like the tariffs on the Chinese uh, import and ex uh, export, and um, um, which is uh, not very good uh, for, for them uh, to, to uh, even to import from China these uh, PPE things. Uh, so we need a better you know, willingness of working with each other uh, and, and see this as a global pandemic, a global threat, uh, and we need a global response and global uh, co collaborations. <laughs> I must only say that uh, your response is uh, exactly spot on and it makes me very happy uh, because it shows to me uh, how much aware uh, you are of the difficulties uh, we face. And on another level, I, um, I have been very, very much impressed by the help that uh, the Chinese government and uh, people has uh, given to Europeans. I have seen a lot of pictures from my friends in Italy of uh, doctors who visited Italy. Uh, in Greece, uh, there have been repeated uh, even donations of uh, masks and uh, visits uh, of uh, people who gave expertise. And this uh, simply shows to me uh, that uh, we uh, can uh, all cooperate, that uh, it is a very uh, important message that no matter if it is a humanitarian level, uh, an economic uh, activity level, we need to all uh, discuss and establish uh, efficient communication of exchange of uh, information and uh, collaborative plans. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's actually a uh, public good for everyone here. Any questions from animator side? or we can switch to students' question part. Okay. I, we, we have actually two questions from students. And uh, the, the second one has been partly answered by our Chinese expert. So I will repeat the first one in English and then in Chinese. So the first question from our audience is after the COVID-19, when do you think the relationship between China and the rest of the world, including political, commercial, or medical, a lot of different fields, the relationship between both parts will be re-established and be stronger. Do you think is opportunity and the challenge both uh, happened on the same time? And when do you think it will it will be happen? Um, 就是关于中国和欧洲、中国和世界的这个关系，有有各种各样的关系当当中有一点就是金融关系。嗯，您觉得会重新建立起来，而且会更强吗？嗯，如果是的话，什么时候您觉得这个这个时机比较好？ Please. <笑> uh, no, I, I think that even in this uh, uh, period of pandemic uh, outbreak, uh, the countries still uh, linked with each other, right? Uh, you might see that uh, there is a temporary need uh, of uh, uh, national quarantine, lockdown, uh, cutting off the uh, uh, flights and uh, um stop the uh, uh, inflow of uh, foreigners uh, so national solution at this time it is necessary uh, in combating uh, this uh, pandemic uh, but at the same time you know as we see that uh, all these PPE uh, donation trading and uh, import ex uh, export uh, the, the, the economies are still uh, closely uh, related. So if you look at the uh, trade figure of the first season uh, of China, uh, you will see a bigger drop of our export, but uh, the import 
is still performed very well. So the China is still importing uh, many of the uh, uh, goods and service from outside the world, uh, which certainly would be, you know, offering these uh, demands uh, for, for foreign economies uh, to sustain their uh, exports and sustain their economy. Uh, so my first point is that countries are still uh, working with each other and benefiting from this relationship, uh, particularly uh, through this uh, uh, trade investment, but not so much through the uh, uh, ex to, to the visiting of people, cross-border visiting of people. Uh, but in any way, uh, with this uh, help of this digital hi highway, uh, we can connect it in, in this way. And it's much convenient and much cheap, right? Uh, so uh, that's my first, first point. Uh, relationship is still there. Uh, the second point is that uh, we also see that uh, quite uh, some negative uh, uh, you know, attitudes, uh, particularly in the media, uh, in some countries uh, towards China. Uh, but I see, uh, you know, some of them uh, is uh, because people want to look at, uh, you know, whether there is, you know, someone uh, we can assign uh, these blames. So I think at this uh, very uh, intense uh, situation, there are certain emotions, feelings that might might not be uh, that strange, right? But we need to, uh, you know, any serious uh, people, when we look at this relationship, uh, you need to look at the broader picture. Uh, you need to look at um, the middle and mid and long term uh, interest and of their countries. Uh, so in that sense, uh, I think uh, even if we have this, uh, some rhetorics, uh, but the foundations of many of the relationship or partnership uh, is still there. Uh, so I think in China, we are not preparing for uh, a new Cold War or new World War. Uh, I don't think that is uh, something that uh, uh, that is going to really happen. Uh, uh, we don't see that uh, uh, other countries will uh, would would uh, make that uh, wrong decision by you know treating the other as a kind of uh, enemy. So I think that uh, even if we have uh, these uh, problems with uh, the like the Trump administrations at, at certain moment, uh, but still uh, we see that uh, the country are, are so closely already tied with each other uh, in in the past uh, and a total uh, link of the economies you know, of this relationship uh, is, uh, it, it is um, there is no, uh, in, uh, there will be the harm uh, to both sides. Uh, so I would say that uh, uh, we are in a, a very difficult time, uh, but countries are still need to work with each other. Uh, uh, we, we hope that uh, all the countries then can work with each other and try to contain the, the outbreak and then we can, uh, you know, uh, becoming, uh, enter into a more no normal uh, situation. For China, we also need the other countries to make their efforts uh, to uh, contain uh, the virus because if you cannot contain it, uh, we might not be uh, returned to the full normalcy. Uh, so it is our both interest that we need to, um, uh, to, um, to, to contain right, uh, this uh, COVID-19. Um, so as Professor Wen talked about, is we need to 
pay a lot more attention uh, beyond ourselves uh, towards the other developing countries. Uh, so, because it is there, uh, if the, uh, the virus is not contained, then there will be much bigger uh, harm to their societies. So in this time, uh, we think that uh, uh, you know, China would have do its part, uh, but we also uh, hope that so with other countries, we can join hands uh, to support uh, these developed countries in a much bigger uh, strengths. And that's why also the WHO is very important at this moment as the most legitimate, most capable international organization, even if people can criticize him uh, from different perspective, but that's the only uh, most legitimate and most capable international organization. And certainly we need to support uh, and, um, and let them to play uh, their due role uh, in, in this uh, pandemic. So my general word is that uh, I'm still positively um, optimistic. Uh, even maybe we need to be uh, cautiously optimistic uh, that mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, no, China would have a good relationship with most of the countries around the world. And um, we certainly will also expect the other countries share the same view uh, on the same page. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, in conclusion, I think is I personally, I indeed believe that this tough moment and the pan pandemic of COVID-19 uh, is definitely a challenge and opportunity for the people uh, worldwide. So we, we can work together um, and uh, we, we are closer. So now I would like to ask our animators, Sylvain, Kistos, and uh, Gilbert, if you have still some questions. If you don't have any more questions, I would like to invite our dear uh, Gilbert to give a close remark. Yes. Okay, so uh, first of all, many thanks, of course, to all those who have animated this session. Uh, I mean, our colleagues from Fudan University, uh, we can never be grateful enough for your contribution today and in the future. And thank you, of course, to our friends, um, Sylvain and Christos, uh, for being present on behalf of our alma mater. Myself being a plastic surgeon, I'm not the best specialist for economy. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, all those who joined uh, on YouTube channel. And if there are still some uh, further questions, it's still possible to send them in by chat. We can forward them to the speakers. And of course, uh, this uh, broadcast can be replayed on the YouTube channel. Many thanks also to Xin King, who is our ambassador between Luxembourg and China universities. Many thanks to uh, Natalie, who is um, listening to us and who is doing a lot of uh, work in the background. And uh, warmest regards to Philippe, who is uh, ascertaining the technical uh, subtleties. So, uh, we are coming to an end for today, but hopefully we have some other projects in the tube and maybe Zin King could give some information about it. Yeah, yes, so next uh, Thursday, so appointment next Thursday, we will have another webinar uh, on the topic of intensive uh, care. Um, and the lessons we learn from this uh, pandemic. Uh, our guests will come from uh, Shanghai Jiao Tong Da uh, Shanghai Jiao Tong Da Xue, uh, and we will inform you as soon as possible the details on the date and the topic by email. Thank you very much. 谢谢大家,谢谢全球的听众还有观众,下个星期同一时间,上海交通大学的专家医学专家会给我们播讲关于新冠肺炎重症医疗方面的经验和体会,谢谢大家。
Okay, so have a uh, Bye. Yeah. Okay. okay. Bye, guys. Really happy. Bye. 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 Bye.